Ramadan only comes once in the Quran, only once. The word Ramadan comes only once in the Quran. And before that, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is talking about general fasting. So the, these are these are the ayat in Surah Al-Baqarah toward the end, where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Ya ayyuhalladina amanu, kutiba alaykum al-siyam. O believers, fasting has been made fard for you, obligatory for you, kutiba alaykum. Kitab means an uh, ordinance as well, by the way. Okay, so it has been made a kitab for you. كَمَا كُتِبَ عَلَى الَّذِينَ مِنْ قَبْلِكُمْ Just like it was ordained for those before you لَعَلَّكُمْ تَتَّقُونَ So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala saying fasting is been made obligatory to you just like the people before you so that meaning this the purpose of fasting is what? لَعَلَّكُمْ تَتَّقُونَ So that you develop taqwa. We've spoken about taqwa. So that is one of the objectives of fasting. This is general fasting, not Ramadan specifically. Okay? But here, um, then the next ayah says, Ayyaman ma'adudat, a few number of days. A few number of days. <clears throat> meaning, meaning this is even less than nine. Okay? What uh, some of the scholars of tafsir say, and uh, inshallah this is a valid interpretation, before Ramadan, there was, uh, before Ramadan made obligatory, by the way, when was the Ramadan made obligatory? Um, during the time of bad, Battle of Badr, okay? So the, the, the Sahaba were fasting before that. But before that, uh, there was fasting that was prescribed. We don't know when exactly, but you know the three days of uh, the white days that we fast, the 13th, 14th, and 15th? Those are the days that were prescribed as optional for uh, for people and uh, for the Muslimin, and it says it's been ordained. So the scholars say this is what Allah Subhanahu wa Taala is referring to here: a few number of days. This is what He was referring to. And we will go into these uh, ayat a little bit more detail as we go through the content. And whoever from you is uh, is sick or is traveling for iddatun min ayam in ukhar then the then you make it up another day if you miss the if you, if you miss the day because you're sick or you're traveling you make it up another day wa ala alladhina yutiqunahu and those who are who it's difficult for to fast it's very it's a hardship for them meaning they're not able to fast and will inshallah drill down fidyatun then they give a fidya what is the fidya ta'amu miskin they feed the poor فَمَنْ تَطَوْعَ خَيْرًا فَهُوَ خَيْرٌ لَهُ خَيْرٌ لَهُ And whoever um, does anything extra optionally beyond the faridah, then it is good. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying that it is good for him. وَأَنْ تَصُومُ خَيْرٌ لَكُمْ But if you fast, that is even better for you. Okay. إِنْ كُنْتُمْ تَعْلَمُونَ Only if you knew. Only if you knew. Shahru Ramadan. Now this is where uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is specifically speaking about Ramadan. Shahru Ramadan alladhi undila fihi al-Qur'an. That Ramadan is the month in which the Qur'an was revealed. Hudan linnas wa bayyinatim min al-huda wal furqan. That it is a guidance for mankind and it's, uh, the, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala here is talking about the Qur'an. It is Shahru Ramadan alladhi undila fihi al-Qur'an. So uh, what is Qur'an? It's a guidance for mankind and clear proofs and guidance and the criterion from right and wrong. فَمَنْ شَهِدَ مِنْكُمْ الشَّهْرِ فَلْيَسُمْ Then here is the ayah that uh, we can focus on a little bit. Uh, right now, inshallah, we'll dive into it. Then whoever witnesses the month from among you, فَلْيَسُمْ Then you should fast. وَمَنْ كَانَ مَرِيضًا أَوْ عَلَى سَفَرْ very similar ayah. Whoever is sick or is traveling, فَعِدَّةٌ مِنْ أَيَّامٍ أُخَرْ Then he makes it up other days. يُرِيدُ اللَّهُ بِكُمُ الْيُسْرِ Allah desires ease for you. وَلَا يُرِيدُ بِكُمُ الْعُسْرِ And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala does not want difficulty for you. Actually, where these ayat come, there's a whole past set of passages in Surah Al-Baqarah toward the end. Where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, this is now obligatory for you. But if you can't do this, then do this. But if you can't do this, then do this. 
and it goes on and on and on and on and on. It's beautiful. So the, 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 the commandment for Ramadan is part of those sets of passages. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala desires, uh, does not desire ease for you and he does not desire difficult, difficulty for you. And Allah desires that you complete the term, the 30 days. Like what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying, if you can't complete the 30 within Ramadan, you still need to complete the 30. You understand? You make up another day. You still complete the 30. And, and Allah wants from you what? وَلِتُكَبِّرُ اللَّهَ عَلَى مَا هَدَاكُمْ So you do the takbir to Allah over the guidance that He gave you. That He gave you guidance. وَلَعَلَّكُمْ تَشْكُرُونَ And so that you are thankful and grateful to Allah. Okay? And um, then there's a portion of dua there, a very, very famous uh, ayah that you all know. وَإِذَا سَعَلَكَ عِبَادِ عَنِّي فَإِنِّي قَرِيبٌ And if my servant asks me, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says to Rasulullah, tell them, I am nearby. أُجِيبُ دَعْوَةَ الدَّعِي إِذَا دعان. Whenever, as soon as someone makes a dua to me, I respond back immediately, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala saying. But in order for that to happen, what do they have to do? فَلْيَسْتِجِيبُ لِي Then they have to obey me, respond to me, respond to me, وَلْيُؤْمِنُوا بِي And they believe in me, لَعَلَّهُمْ يَرْشُدُونَ So that they are appropriately guided. So that they're appropriately guided. And right after that, there's a longer ayah, and I have just an excerpt on here. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in this uh, last ayah, وَكُلُوا وَشْرَبُوا And eat and drink حَتَّى يَتَبَيَّنَ لَكُمُ الْخَيْطُ الْأَبْيَدُ مِنَ الْخَيْطِ الْأَسْوَدِ مِنَ الْفَجْرِ Until you can distinguish the Fajr time and how does Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala describe the Fajr time? It is the when you can tell the white thread from the dark thread, from the black thread. ثُمَّ أُتِمُّ الصِّيَامِ إِلَى اللَّيْلِ And then you fast until night time. This is what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying. The news fast until night time. Okay. So I just wanted to give you a general idea of what's in the Quran. There's a few details that I purposefully skipped, but inshallah we'll get into it. Inshallah. Um, start of the month. Okay. I'm going to skip the purpose of fasting because we've been ta talking about the Zad Ram as part of the Zad Ramadan series. We've covered a lot of ahadith on Ramadan already. So those who, who missed it, they're, they're available on YouTube. So, start of Ramadan. Let's talk about that. فَمَنْ شَهِدَ مِنْكُمْ الشَّهْرُ فَلْيَصُمْ This is what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says. When you wit whoever from among you witnesses the month, they must fast. Fasting is obligated, uh, obligated on them. And Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, just like a hadith we learned, I believe, last week, سُمُوا لِرُؤْيَتِهِ وَأَفْتِرُوا لِرُؤْيَتِهِ that you, you're fasting, you, you should fast when you see it. And you break your fast when you don't see it. Break your fast meaning you stop fasting. Uh, Ramadan is over. When you see it. <laughs> but if you can't see the moon, then you consider Shaban as a 30 day month. Okay, and then you, you continue and you Ramadan. Okay, one thing that not a lot of people know about, maybe, I'm assuming, at least I'm just going to say, I didn't know about until much later on. Lunar cycle. Lunar cycle? How many days does it take for the moon to go around the earth? 29 and a half. So it's not 29. It's not 30. It is 29 and a half. It's called the synodic month. Synodic month. Now you understand why is it a challenge to find the moon? Is it 29 days? Is it 30 days? This is why. It's 29 and a half days. So that half can fall anywhere, right? In any month. So you're always looking for the moon. 29 and a half days. And the synodic year is, if you just multiply this by 12, is 354 days and uh, it's about 10 to 11 days short than the solar year. Solar year. Clear? Does that make sense? Hopefully that helps you appreciate and understand why is there a problem. Okay? Yes. Uh, yeah, yeah, of course. Yeah, of course. Yeah. 
You don't need to ask me. You're the boss. MashaAllah. Okay. So, how was sighting done pre-modernity? Why are we talking about pre-modernity? There was no mass communication, instant communication, nothing. You cannot communicate with people instantly. So, even if you lived, <clears throat> let's say, 50 miles away, 100 miles away, it's going to take you a day, two, three to even get the news. So, there's no immediate news, right? So, in the old days, what was all sighting? It was always local, wherever you are. You're citing locally. I don't want to spend too much time here. <clears throat> How many people does it take to actually uh, consider the month sufficient to, I'm sorry, to consider? Do you need two people to witness the moon for it to be valid or one people? There's multiple opinions. Both are, both are opinions. I'm not getting into the right and wrong. But the general majority in the locality, they witness the moon and then, then that is the moon, right? Then the, it's the start of the month. Okay, now the problem is the, the moon fighting that happens every year on Ramadan and Eid and everything like that uh, is really a modern phenomenon as you can understand because of the instant communication. Okay, so the globalization has complicated the story. This, uh, there was some evidence of that, but I'm just going to go straight to the recommendation. What is the ideal situation? The ideal situation is that in North America, there needs to be a central body that everybody recognizes that they are the ones who will speak to all of North America. Because regionally, that will work if you, uh, this is more of a geographical, ge geographical aspect, right? This is not a scholarly thing. S scholars tell you what Islam says. Geo Geographers, they would interpret what Islam says and then apply it, right? So you don't need, you don't need just scholars opinion. You need to work with scientists to figure all this stuff out. Scholars are not going to know. They're not, they're not as educated in geography and astronomy and those kinds of things. Anyway, so there needs to be a central body in North America to decide since there's not one, there's many. And we haven't really, Safarullah, decided on one body. That doesn't work. Okay, what do we do? Strongest opinion, cite locally, meaning for the particular city or to the best, widest ex extent possible. So somebody can say, okay, at least in Georgia, we can have a unified committee, at least in Georgia, say, or at least Georgia and Alabama and Tennessee, like as, ex as uh, vast as possible. And Florida is a little bit distant, so might, it might be a different region, but at least in this locality, well, I'm just giving you an idea. Right? I'm not here to tell you what is right or what is wrong. Strongest opinion is, as far as the locality can reach that would make sense, cite there and there needs to be a body and then everybody should follow that. Should Saudi, should Saudi citing be followed? No, there's no opinion like that. There's no opinion like that. But what happens is the sun is moving clockwise, right? Clockwise around the earth. What comes before, like Japan, for, for example, when it's Monday, Japan will see Monday first, right? And then it will be the rest of Asia, then it would be the Middle East, and then it will be Africa, and then it will be the Pacific, I'm sorry, Atlantic, and then it will be North America. So obviously, if the moon is sighted by a nation before America, what do you think? Are we not going to see it here? Yes, we are. How much? You know, that all depends on where the moon is actually born. But more, more than likely, more than likely, if the moon is sighted in Saudi it will be sh shown, it, it will be visible here. If it was sighted in Pakistan, it will be sh shown here. If it will be sighted in Japan, it will be shown here. Does that make sense? Because that's just how things work, right? Okay. All right. Um, so in absence of all of this, since we have none of this, what do we do? What do we do? We, at least in Atlanta, need to have a unified front across all masajid. There needs to be a designated committee established for that. And pretty much that's what happens. I don't have a lot of details around that. But the reason is because unity is first and foremost in the Islam. Yadullah ala al-jama'ah. Allah's blessings is, a, is upon un, unity. And Rasulullah commanded, فَعَلَيْكُمْ بِالْجَمَعَةِ You must be united. 
So unity comes before personal preferences. So mas masajid that are breaking away, and they're like, no, they're going to do their own moon sighting. Wallah, they're not following the sunnah. That is not what, what, what was desired. So if there's a united body, which pretty much is the case, um, they're the ones who sight the moon. Let's say they're wrong. If they were wrong, very quickly, Rasulullah said, your fasting begins, your, your Ramadan begins when you start to fast, and your Ramadan ends when you stop fasting, meaning even if you get it wrong. If everybody started to fast one day, Alhamdulillah Rabbil Alameen. That was the start of Ramadan. And everybody, when they stop fasting another day, uh, the other day, that will be the end of Ramadan. Clear? So what should be? We should be united in Atlanta. That's the most important thing. And not break away into factions. Okay. End of the month. Obviously, same kind of sighting of the moon. And some scholars say that if the moon, again, for Eid is hidden, then from the start of Shaban to the end of Ramadan, you, you think, you count 60 days. And that's the completion of Ramadan. From the start of Shaban, you complete 60 days. Any questions on this? I know this is a little bit technical and a little bit maybe not as interesting. Because none of us are doing that, right? None of us are actually doing that. This is more for the for the management and the boards of the masajid and the local Islamic community. But I just wanted to give you an idea. Biggest takeaway, be united. Biggest takeaway, be united. Don't break away from the jama'ah. All right. Okay. Obligation to fast. We already know from the Quran, kutiba alaykum. Uh, a suyan, right? The fasting has been prescribed to you. What about the fasting of Ramadan? Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, the famous five pillar hadith, what is it? Buni al-Islam, ala khams. Right? Ala khams. Uh, Islam is based on five things and out of which we have usam Ramadan and fasting of Ramadan. By the way, this order of shahada and then salah and zakah and hajj and Ramadan at the end, this is not in some, in all narrations, it's different orders. Okay. But the, but the order that doesn't change the most is at least shahada and salah. They are always one after the other. Okay. And then the order of the others change. Okay. Let's now talk about, I kind of created this graph for you just so that you kind of understand who is obligated to fast. There are people who are obligated to fast, and then there are people that are exempted from fasting. Exempted meaning not just excused, they're exempted. They don't have to fast, okay? And we will talk about them in detail. In those who are obligated, they can be temporarily prohibited from fasting, meaning it's haram to fast for them, temporarily. And there are those who are obligated, they are excused, temporarily excused from fasting. Okay, so who are the prohibited? Only one kind, women in their menstruation. In the monthly cycle, they, they should not fast. It will be haram for them to fast during that day, um, during those days. But from an obligation point of view, if you are a traveler or you're sick or there's a hardship for you to fast, basically if there's a hardship for you to fast, period, right? You are temporarily excused until that hardship is lifted. Hardship to fast, not hardship in general. Hardship to fast only, then you should. Then you're excused from fasting. And who are exempted? The exempted ones who are chronically sick, old age, um, those who need to constantly take medications all the time to survive, those who have no capability to fast. Even they can't stop eating; otherwise, their sugar is gonna, you know, drop or rise or whatever. Some kind of situation that they're chronically sick they are excused from fasting. Clear? So we have two categories of uh, people, obligated ones and the, ex and the one who are exempted, completely exempted. And the obligating, they're, they're prohibited and excused. Okay, so let's look at the obligation. Who is obligated in general? There's a term called mukallaf. Have you, how many people know this term? Mukallaf, taklif. In Urdu we say taklif means pain or uh, problem, right? But it's not, in Arabic, that's not what it means. Taklif means responsibility. Taklif means 
responsibility, accountability, you're accountable. So who has the taklif of Ramadan? Who is accountable for Ramadan? You have to be Muslim, you have to be pubescent, baligh, right? And you have to have aql, you have to have, uh, you, you are aql, meaning you're, you're mentally sane, right? If you're not mentally sane, you're exempted. For example, you have some kind of disability, you kind of have mental illness, illness, you're in a coma, um, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protect us. Those kinds of situations, who, those who are completely, uh, let's say, intoxicated, they, they're not aqal, right? They don't know what's right or what's wrong or what, you know, is a day or night. If you're in the hospital, you're hospitalized, you're, you know, you're, they're sh putting morphine and morphine inside of you. You don't know what's day or night or three o'clock or two or, or three o'clock in the morning or two o'clock at night. You have no idea. So that is, you're not aqal there. So you're not obligated. I just wanted to understand the obligation. By the way, this is true. This obligation is just not just for fasting. It's for all of Islam. All obligations in Islam, you must be Muslim. Non-Muslims are not obligated. They're, okay? That, because it doesn't make sense. And you have to be pubescent and you have to be aqal. <clears throat> and here is a very interesting, beautiful hadith. I, I'm feeling a little bit warm. Are you guys feeling a little bit warm? Okay, yeah, then let's do something about that, inshallah. Okay. Um, so, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, the pen has been lifted from three types of people. The pen has been lifted. What does that mean? You know, the angels that are writing your sins down? Or, or even good deeds. The pen has been lifted from three kinds of people. An na'im hatta yastaykaz. The one who is sleeping until they wake up. What does that mean? For example, you slept through Fajr. You didn't intend to sleep. You had the alarm on and everything, but you just, you were sleeping and you just couldn't wake up, right? Even if you woke up at the alarm, you shut the alarm in your absent mindedness and then you went to sleep and you missed Fajr. When you get up, so you're not sinful. You're not sinful, sinful for missing Fajr because of that. If you had the intention to wake up, obviously if you didn't have the intention, everything is based on intention, right? Okay. So, when you wake up from Fajr, uh, for, uh, when you wake up, your time for Fajr is when you wake up. That is your time. Does that make sense? So, the pen has been lifted from three. The, the one who is sleeping until they wake up. A sabi hatta yahtalim. And a child until they're pubescent. So, it, they're not, their sins are not written down. If you're a child, your sins are not written down. Until you become pubescent. Then, you are accountable. Right? And al majnoon hatta yaqil, and the one who um, does not is not sane mentally, then they are. Uh, then until they gain their sanity back, only then they will be accountable. They are not accountable if they don't have sanity. Okay. Any questions on this? All right. So these this what we just covered is obligation. Who is obligated? But who is temporarily prohibited? We already spoke about it. Women in their monthly cycle, they should not fast. It's haram for them to fast. Who is temporarily excused? The traveler. Okay? So this is where now we're going into the Quran. فَمَنْ كَانَ مِنْكُمْ مَرِيضًا Then whoever from you is sick, أَوْ عَلَى سَفَرْ Or you are traveling. Okay? So the one who is permitted to... So who is traveling? When you can shorten your prayers, who exactly what makes a traveler a traveler that's a whole different discussion which i want to leave to the side uh, but very generally if you're packing your bags if you're packing your bags and your toothpaste and your whatever you need you're traveling okay it distance is irrelevant necessarily okay uh and also should you be fasting when uh, even if uh even uh, if you're traveling, should you be fasting? If you can, you should. Fasting in the old days was extremely difficult, right? Because you're traveling through the, through the desert and hot journey and it's not for the, um, it's not easy. But Rasulullah sometimes on a, on a shorter journey, he fasted. So you can fast, but he said, he warned people, لَيْسَ مِنَ الْبِدْرِ أَصْيَامُ فِي السَّفْرِ that it is not considered righteousness if you fast during travel. 
What does that mean? That means don't expect Allah to reward you extra that you're fasting and suffering. Because when you have a rukhsah, when there is a, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives you an excuse, a rukhsah, take the rukhsah. Take the rukhsah. Azima, azima means the opposite of rukhsah. Like if you're going to do it anyway, don't expect extra reward from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. لَيْسَ مِنَ الْبِرِّ أَصْصِيَامُ فِي السَّفْرِ So a lot, of, a lot of scholars, just based on this hadith, they recommend against um, fasting and suffer. Now, you know your condition best. So if you think fasting one day, if I missed fasting one day because I'm traveling for whatever reason, I'm going to break my momentum and I might, it might be difficult for me to start fasting again because you know, you're, you're part of the particular mind. You know yourself better. In that case, fast. If you know it will be good for your continuity in your iman, then fast. Does that make sense? Otherwise, break. Questions? <laughs> I told you, that's a whole different discussion. There is no, according to the modern scholars, there is no minimum distance. That 80, 80 mile thing, 83 mile thing, that actually has a history. And it's not very Islamic. I'll just leave it at that. Yes. What, what about you make the intention of, uh, you know, uh, fasting while you're traveling, but then halfway you realize... Uh, like, yeah, break it. Break. Yeah, absolutely. When you're traveling, for example, in the, uh, you're fasting, you had an intention to fast, in the afternoon you started to feel extremely sick. What are you going to do? Continue to fast? No. You, you're going to break your fast. Right? You need to take some medication or feeling nausea, whatever. Just like that, in the middle of the travel, you're fasting. You shouldn't be fasting, but only if you did. Then, um, if you're fasting and you suddenly, you know, feel like you, it's it's going to be difficult for you, then you need to break your fast. Okay. I had one other thing in mind. Oh yes. Let's say your flight is at three o'clock in the afternoon. Okay, your flight is three o'clock in the afternoon. Should you not fast that day? No, you should fast that day. You only fast when you begin travel. Because you don't know your flight might get delayed, you might not travel, whatever. You can't skip that day. Very important. You fast that day. You fast that day and you only break if you have to, if it's difficult for you, um, when you start traveling. Does that make sense? Clear? Okay, good. Temporary sickness or any kind of difficulty to fast. Any kind. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, فَمَنْ كَانَ مِنْكُمْ مَرِيضًا If you are sick. Temporary sickness, that can be lifted later on. Okay? And if they, if they still can fast during their sickness, then they're rewarded. I mean, rewarded for fasting, not extra rewarded. Okay? Because why are they not extra rewarded? then people would want to, for just for the reward, they would want to harm themselves. Islam doesn't want you to harm yourself. Does that make sense? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Yuridu bikumul yusr, wa la yuridu bikumul usr. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala does not want difficulty for you. So this is why Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa said, don't consider it righteousness that you're fasting during travel. Similarly, if you're sick and if you're able to fast, that's fine. By the way, what does sick mean? What does sick mean? If you um, ha got a cut on your arm and, you know, whatever, now you can't fast? No. It has nothing to do with fasting. That, that's not sickness. But if you have a fever, really bad fever, and if you don't drink water and you don't take Tylenol, your, your fever is going to go really high, and you're not able to control it, then you shouldn't be fasting. Does that make sense? If you have a stomach ache and you need to take medication to, for, for you to take, take care of it or eat something or whatever, you shouldn't fast. But if you're, if you're, uh, if you twisted your ankle, but you know, you don't need medication at that time immediately or whatever, fast. It has nothing to do with fasting. Only when it's difficult for you to fast. Clear? So that is sickness. It's not any kind of sickness. Pregnant or nursing. So a lot, this is just as extremely, uh, really for, for the, for our sisters over here. But in general, there's a misconception 
that uh, women who are pregnant or they're nursing, they shouldn't fast. That is not true. That is not true by any scholar or school. It's not true. Only when they feel that fasting will harm the baby, either during pregnancy or during nursing, then you don't fast. And you still need to make that up. Okay, we'll talk about makeup later. But, but just because you're pregnant or you're nursing means you can't fast? No, that is not at all true. So there are uh, <clears throat> sheikhahs out there in the U.S. and everywhere in the world screaming at the top of their lungs, women, you have a debt you owe to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You've missed so many fasts just because you think you're, you're pregnant and you can't fast? No, that's not true. Clear? Yeah, either from a doctor or they know themselves. You, they, don't, they, don't, they know themselves. Does that, does that make clear? Yeah. So that's really what that section is trying to say. Okay? Harm, harming yourself or harming others, causing harm or receiving harm. I'll say that again. Harming yourself or harming others. Causing harm or receiving harm. That is not from Islam. Any kind of harm. La darar wa la darar. No harming. No harming. <laughs> Essentially, I'll just say it this way. That is not Islam. It's a rule, principle in Islam. Okay. All right. Let's talk. Any questions on that one? Okay. Exempted. Those who are completely exempted. Those who are complete. Yes. Question. Okay. وَعَلَى الَّذِينَ يُطِيقُونَهُ فِدْيَةٌ طَعَامُ مِسْكِينَ We just we just read that in the ayah. Then those who have difficulty fasting at all, at all, not temporarily, but at all, then they need to give a fidya طَعَامُ مِسْكِينَ We'll we'll talk about the fidya later. But uh, but فَمَنْ تَطَوَى خَيْرًا فَهُوَ خَيْرٌ لَهُ But they they do something extra, meaning. They give extra charity, not just the minimum, or they try to even fast, and if they can't fast, they, they only are able to fast half a day. They're trying, right? They're trying. They're still trying, but they can't. So then they are completely exempted, but they can still try to do extra whatever they can. This is what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying, and this is what Ibn Kathir also says in his tafsir, that try to do it, and if you can't, then stop. Okay? So this is like chronic sickness, old age, if they are fasting, obviously their fasting is accepted, then they're rewarded for that, right? Otherwise, they have to do it'am. We'll talk about it'am. Well, just talk about now. What is it'am? It'am means feeding the poor, feeding the needy, one meal. What is one meal? What you will consider a comfortable single meal. Not just, you know, one dollar, you know, go buy yourself some chips. No, it no, that's not a meal. Okay, that's not a meal. So, because of inflation now, I, I can very, very comfortably tell you one single meal is probably twelve to fifteen dollars, right? Twelve to fifteen dollars. So, if you Allah Subhanahu wa Taala says, if you do extra, I will reward you more. So you can choose twelve dollars as the meal for itam, but if you want to do extra, you can go fifteen. 20, right? But don't make it more exorbitant because that's not correct. Okay? But if you do extra, does that make sense? Well, I have to check on that. I don't know if you can give more. Obviously, you can give as much sadaqah to the needy as much as possible. So I'll hold my thought on that. I don't know the answer. But I will say you can do extra. Okay? I'll just leave it at that. Don't do the ultimate bare minimum because that's not right. You wouldn't want that for yourself from somebody else, right? If somebody gave you, okay, you're really hungry and you need a meal, somebody just gave you $12, you'd be more comfortable with maybe with a $20 bill, right? And maybe, maybe, maybe you look at the currencies too. And if the, if you have a $10 bill and a $20 bill, don't break that into half. Maybe you give the person $20. That might be even better, right? Yes? Is it feeding one person per day? Per day, per day. One person several times or? Great question. Uh, so since we're talking about Atan, you can feed the same person all 30 days or you can every single day you can change people. It doesn't matter. But it's one, I, I guess the 
question one person. One person. No, one meal or three meals? One meal. One meal. One meal. Either breakfast, lunch, or dinner. One meal. Not one day. The con okay, clarification. The concept of three meals a day, that's a modern concept. It's a commer it's a capitalism concept that didn't exist in the old days. They pretty much had one meal a day, or maybe two. Okay, the whole concept of breakfast, lunch, and dinner does did not exist for all of humanity long time ago. Yeah, I mean, not long time ago. Not long ago, right? This is a modern thing. Okay? I don't know if you knew that, you can look it up. Okay, people didn't maybe eat like twice a day. Okay. Um, okay, now for the ada. Ada means fulfillment, fulfilling. Ful, uh, fulfilling. How do you fulfill the fast of Ramadan? What makes your fasting valid fasting? That's in Arabic, it's called ada. Everybody knows ada, right? There's qada. Qada means you couldn't do the ada, so you make up. It's called qada. But the, but the, but the, <laughs> Fulfilling, valid fulfillment is called ada. Okay, I'm just giving you some thick terms so that you guys understand. This is, for example, when I pray on time, I'm doing the ada of salah. When I'm giving zakah appropriately, I'm doing the ada of zakah. Right? When I'm doing hajj appropriately, I'm doing the ada of hajj. Similarly, there's the ada of fasting. What is, what, what is valid? What is considered valid? Sahih is called in also in thick terms. Okay, so what is the ada of fasting? So you have no inhibitors. Meaning, it's not haram for you to fast and it's not going to cause harm. Right? Either you're traveling or you're sick or you're chronic, uh, chronically sick. Right? If it's, so there's no inhibitors. Nothing stopping you from fasting. So this is extremely important in fiqh. Like for example, um, for example, you enter the masjid and it's time for Tahiyatul Masjid. Tahiyatul Masjid. You, when you enter the masjid, you pray Tahiyatul Masjid. Now, it's the forbidden time to pray. What should you do? So there's a mana, there's an, an, something inhibiting you from actually praying. Right? So you, ideally, Ideally, some scholars will say you will still go ahead and pray because that's an exception. Um, and some scholars will say actually you should not because that's a prohibited time. So when you entered the masjid, you, you shouldn't pray to Hitul Masjid until the prohibition, prohibited time is over. I'm just giving you an idea what a prohibition is, right? For example, you're, you, it's, it's Asr time and you're a woman and you're about to pray, but you realize that you, it's not, your monthly cycle has begun. Okay, now something is stopping you from doing the Ada. Does that make sense? Everybody with me? Okay. I, I see some dazed looks. I don't know if I'm using too many, too many fancy terms. Should I not use these terms? It's okay? Okay. So there's no mania. There's no inhibitor, right? From you to fast. The second condition, you have to have the intention to fast. We'll talk about that in a second. You, then you do the imsak, the abstention, meaning you abstain from what things? We'll talk about those as well, right? And then you, you have to complete the duration of the day. So what makes a valid fast? Nothing is stopping you from fasting. You have the intention to fast. And then you actually, then do the abstention, imsak. And then you do the, then you f do the imsak for the whole duration of the day. Make sense? Clear? This is just a general framework. By the way, imsak doesn't mean just that time before Fajr when in the calendar you see imsak time. Imsak in general, imsak means abstention. That just means you stop eating and drinking. That's what it means. It's not, it's not, it, it's a, imsak and fasting is one and the same. Imsak and fasting is the same thing. Okay? Good? Okay. All right. Then now let's go into the details. We've already talked about this. Okay, maybe, maybe, so no inhibitors, so you're not prohibited, you're not excused, you have the intention, um, the duration is start of Fajr, and we're going to talk about Fajr a lot right now. Okay, I want to clarify some misconceptions, inshallah. And that, uh, you end at Maghrib, you abstain from eating and drinking, and you ex abstain from that 
one marital act. That one marital act. That's the only thing you shouldn't do. That's it. Okay? And then there's the adab of fasting. We've already talked about it. Right? What is the adab of fasting? You shouldn't tell lies. You do extra dhikr. You, you enhance your fast. Does that make sense? You're not just doing the bare ada. You're not doing the bare minimum ada that's in the fiqh books. It doesn't work that way. Islam is not a book of fiqh like that. Fiqh of book is meant, it's designed to be the bare minimum. It's designed to be that way. Because the fuqaha don't want to burden you with extra things. Then it is the tazkiyah, the people of tazkiyah that will tell you that is not, that is just the bare minimum. This is how you enhance your iman. This is how you move from Islam to ihsan. Okay? Clear? If you don't have that etiquette, Anyway, we'll talk about that in a second. Okay, so no inhibitors. We've already talked about that. Let's now talk about niyyah. Everybody knows, إِنَّمَا الْأَعْمَالُ niyat. I'm not even going to translate it. You should know this. Okay? So, uh, a non-verbal niyyah at night before you go to sleep that I'm going to fast tomorrow, it's good enough. Do you have to wake, for, wake up for shukur? No, you do not. You do not. So, when it's Fajr time, you, obviously, hopefully, you prayed Fajr, right? But not praying Fajr doesn't invalidate your fast. Not praying any Salah, is, you're still fasting is separate from Salah. Does that make sense? At a, at a technical level. Fasting is separate from Salah at a technical level. Okay? Is your fasting valid? Yes, it's valid, technically. But anyways, uh, you guys get what I'm trying to say, inshallah. Okay, so you have to have a general niya. Do you have to say, girls, please, no talking, please, please. Is there, is there a question? No, no question? Okay, you good? Okay, mashallah. It, it, it just distracts me. Otherwise, you know, you're more than welcome. If we had a bigger masjid, inshallah, we will soon. We will soon, Allah willing. And then, then you can go to town, inshallah. Inshallah. Okay. Um, but you know, you know how much I love you guys, right? Okay. Um, do you have to say specific something specific for Nia? No, there is no such thing. There is no such thing. Not in any madhab. Okay. Uh, to Hanafi, uh, in according to the Hanafi uh, uh, fiqh, you have to, you must have the intent. You must have the intention every single night. According to some others, you can have a general intention for all of Ramadan. I'm going to attempt to fast every single day. Okay. Is it good to always intend that I'm going to be fasting the next day? Yes. And you automatically have that anyway. So everybody's safe, right? Those who really want to skip fasting are going to have an niya problem, right? An intention problem. Otherwise, you're fine. Okay. It's not really a fit question. Okay. Okay. What? Okay. What if you wake up after Fajr? Okay, we'll talk about that inshallah. Now, let's talk about imsak, the abstention. Again, imsak is not that time. Imsak is what you do. Okay, imsak is what you do. It's not the time. Okay. So, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa I'm sorry, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, wa kulu wa shrabu hatta al-fajr. Okay, eat and drink until fajr. Did it ring some alarm bells in your head? It did, right? What does the Quran say? Eat and drink until Fajr. Okay, we'll talk about why the why why the alarm bells rang inshallah in your head. This is the Quran. I'm not, I'm not making this up, okay? Okay? Okay, and what is abstention? Okay, so Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says eat and drink until fajr so the opposite is true right so when you begin fasting you stop eating and you stop drinking clear okay what is eating and drinking it is swallowing putting something in your mouth is not swallowing swallowing for nourishment to give your body nourishment that is what abstention is about it's not putting something in your mouth okay well technically speaking and then the other thing you're not supposed to do, so Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, uh, Okay, 
uh, that it is allowed for you to be intimate with your spouses at night, which means what? When it's Fajr time, then you stop. That's what it means. Okay? So abstention from that one air marital act. So those are the three things that we're supposed to stop. Well, two things really. Swallowing for nourishment, just to simplify, and the marital act. Okay. The etiquette of fasting, this is the extra, right? What is the adab of fasting? We already talked about it. You're not going to find this, find this in the books of fiqh, that you should be doing these things. No, you're not, because the book of, book of fits are designed to be the bare minimum. So, uh, uh, so you do whatever, you control not only your food intake, basically you're controlling your bodily desires, aren't you? Your bodily desires? What about the desires of your nafs? The, the anger, the negativity inside of you, you control that as well. Right? The lack of patience, impatience, you control that as well. Okay, these are the adab, these are gonna enhance your fasting. And uh, your outburst. Now, you control your outburst as well. So, remember we read, uh, read the hadith, when somebody is nasty to you, Rasulullah said, remind yourself that I'm fasting, I'm fasting. So meaning, remind yourself, I'm fa I, I need to control my tongue. Even though I can respond, I have the power to respond. And by the way, when you have the power to respond and then you stop, Quran speaks so highly of that. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, then the ajr for that for, from Allah is unlimited. If you control your outburst, when you have the power to burst, like let's say you're a boss, let's say, and you have an employee that you can be angry with, let's say, let's say and you have the option to be harsh, really harsh, badly, right? Sometimes harshness is needed for uh, general discipline. I'm not talking about that. I'm saying unnecessarily rude and ridiculous to an employee. You have the power, right? Or you can choose not to do that. When you do that, your reward, فمن, uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, I, I, wa, wa ajruhu ilallah. And then the reward for it is up to Allah. It is something huge. Just like fasting. The, the reward for fasting is up to Allah. Just like holding your, controlling your anger. When you can be angry, and it's okay for you to be angry, if the reward is unlimited. Blows your mind? <laughs> it, I know I went into a tangent. I'll come back inshallah. If you guys are interested, we could talk about the ayah later on. Okay, then Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam also said, مَنْ لَمْ يَدَعْ قَوْلُ الزُّورِ وَالْعَمَلِ Whoever does not uh, stop with speaking falsehood or doing false things, meaning all of the bad things, while they're fasting, وَالْجَهَلِ uh, <clears throat> and being irrational, فَلَيْسَ لِلَّهِ حَاجَةً أَنْ يَدَعْ طَعَمَهُ وَشَرَابَهُ Then Allah has no need for him to leave his food or drink. If you can't stop being nasty, Allah has no need for you to fast. Okay, and then another another rare hadith. رَبَّ صَائِمٌ حَظُّهُ مِنْ صُيَامِهِ الْجُوعُ وَالْعَطَشُ Okay, it may be that the fasting person gets no reward for his fasting except hunger and thirst. We don't, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala not make us from those. That you will get nothing out of your fasting other than just hunger and thirst. وَرُبَّ قَائِمٍ حَظُّهُ مِنْ قِيَامِهِ السَّهَرُ and then the one who does the Qiyam al-Layl, he gets nothing out of the Qiyam al-Layl except being awake. Meaning there's no reward. So may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala give us the reward and give us, uh, give us the intellect. Okay, duration. Now let's talk about Fajr and duration. You guys ready for this? Okay, inshallah. Waqt al-Imsak. When do you start the abstention? Okay. So that when is the time? So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, what did he say? Kulu wa shrabu hatta yatabayyana lakum al-khayt al-abyudu min al-khayt al-aswadi min al-fajr. So eat and drink until fajr, until you clearly can see fajr. Okay, science lesson. Everybody lessons ready for science lesson, inshallah? Extremely important. <clears throat> this is what the astronomers consider the zones of twilight. 
These are the phases of the zones of twilight. At 18 degrees, <clears throat> before 18 degrees, it's considered nighttime, meaning it's pitch dark. <clears throat> the sun, nothing is visible from the sun. Nothing. Okay? I have it. Alhamdulillah. <clears throat> then between 18 to 12 degrees, this is called the astronomical twilight. These names are not necessarily important unless you're a geek like me. Then from 12 degrees to 6 degrees is called the nautical twilight. And <clears throat> from 6 degrees to 0 degrees at the, at the horizon is called the civil twilight. I'll tell you, I have a video. You want to see the video? Inshallah, I'll show you, okay? Do you'll be able to tell. So uh, you're not just having to imagine, inshallah. Civil twilight is, you know, at, um, at, after you're done with Fajr, uh, let's say you did, did your Athkar, you look outside and it's kind of, kind of bright already almost, and you're like, ah, oh, that's that time. <laughs> or when you wake up for your Fajr and you're like, oh, let me check the time, is it, do I still have time for Fajr or not? Right? That time, that brightest time, that's called the civil twilight, before the sunrise. And then the sun rises. And that's called the golden hour. Clear? So far? Okay. So let's look at the video, then we'll kind of watch something, inshallah. Uh, we don't need the audio. Actually, this is the audio. So this is before 18 degrees. Now 18 degrees. Do you see anything? Nothing. This is 18 degrees. It's not Fajr. It's not a very long video. Can I speed it up a little bit? Now this is the nautical twilight. This is the 12 degrees. I'll explain. This is the civil twilight. This is the six degrees. You guys see see that? I, I'm happy to send you this video too, inshallah. And then sunrise. Okay? Clear? You guys get an idea? Did you see 18 degrees, how dark it was? Okay, how did the 18 degrees start? So Umm al Qura, for example, is 18 degrees and from the old days, it's been considered that Fajr is 18 degrees Fajr. Um, actually, if you look on your all your Islamic apps, that Allah um, Masallim. Okay, where was I? Yes, all your apps are actually at 15 degrees. Okay, so the truth of the matter is, 18 degrees, almost nowhere is the right time for Fajr. Okay. It is, uh, you can say, a safer time, maybe, uh, but it's not necessarily a right time for Fajr. Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says Fajr begins when you can distinguish the white thread from the dark thread, and that happened between 12 and 6, I'm sorry, 18 and 12 degrees, between it. Not, not at 18, because it was completely nighttime. And by the way, it depends where you are on earth. And, and if you're in India or... Mecca or you're in US, it's going to be different. Not everywhere on the face of the earth. Can you guys go and mute if you don't mind? Let me see. Uh, yeah. Can I mute them? I can't mute them. Was it? Where? Oh, yeah. Jazakallah khair. <laughs> Um, I don't like Zoom. I don't know. I don't think it worked. But anyways, um, what, what was I saying? Yeah. So everywhere on the surface of the planet, it's not, you don't know. And, and the time for Fajr changes from season to season. What do you do? What do you do? It is not easy. It's not, even apps have a hard time with it. Okay. So trust me and trust the scholars. The, what are the designation of ISTA being 15 degrees average for North America is good. Is good. Just stay with it. Fajr is not an exact science. 
It's not by the millisecond. It's not by the minute. Okay? Fajr is not by... Islam doesn't work that way. That oop, one millisecond, it's uh, end of Dhuhr, and that next millisecond is the start of Asr. It doesn't work that way. It doesn't. Islam is not like that. There is a gray area, as you can imagine. Don't be super obsessed about the exact second, okay? Now, if you wake up for Fajr, let's say you woke up late, and you are, let's say, 30 seconds beyond it, or one minute beyond it, should you say, oh, man, I can't eat anything, I can't drink water? No, maybe you can, because it's not an exact science. You understand? Lots of evidences for that. I'm not going to get into it right now, but I'm just telling you, don't be like that. Don't be obsessive. I hope that was helpful. Okay? Yes? What, when you say degrees, what, um, what is exactly the degrees in relation to what? what degrees of what? But, uh, horizon. Horizon. Flat. This, this zero degrees. Uh, the earth. Okay. Right? Where you are. That's your horizon. That's, when you're looking at the horizon in front of you, let's say you're standing in front of the ocean. Right, you're at the seashore, what's in front of you, right there, that ocean right there, that's zero degrees. So six degrees below, eight, 12 degrees, six, get it? Okay, all right. And by the way, just like Fajr, these are the degrees, these are the zones, for Maghrib and Isha, it's also the same zones. So when do you think Isha begins? Just FYI, at 18 degrees. Right, because then, then when it's no twilight, right? Zero twilight? Yeah. Okay. Some, somewhere between 12 to 18, to, between 12 to, so also it's used 15 degrees for Aisha. So you will see if you open up your, uh, your Salah time app, you will see Isna 15 degrees. If you've set it for, for that, if you set it up for Karachi University or, uh, or, uh, Umm al Qurav of Mecca, it, it will actually use 18 degrees. Yes. Mm. Yes, excellent question. Excellent question. Uh go ahead. It's depends where you are on earth. So in yes, yeah, typical in Atlanta you mean, right? About 20 minutes. 20. So the difference between 18 degrees and 15 degrees is 20 minutes earlier. 20. Okay. All right. So we already talked about how um, how uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran, eat and drink until Fajr. The, then you, the question is when is Fajr according to you? You follow your scholar. Don't follow me. Please don't follow me. You follow your scholar. I'm just educating right here. Okay. Um, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said فَكُلُوا وَشْرَبُوا حَتَّى يُؤَذِّنْ ibn Ummi Maktum." Remember the hadith from last time? Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam had two mu'adhin and he says don't eat if, if Bilal makes the adhan continue to eat and drink but stop eating until ibn Ummi Maktum starts the fajr uh, starts to uh, call the adhan meaning that's the time for fajr okay uh, and Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa also said, if one of you hears the adhan and they still have something in their mouth or they're drinking a cup of water and they have just cup in their hand, finish it. Don't spit it out. Okay? Some, there's different interpretations of that. Some recommend spitting it out. Wallahu I'm just educating you. Okay. Now, in the Ramadan calendars, we, I chose not to do that for our calendar because it's up to you. I'm not going to force anything on you. So here I'm educating you. Now listen very carefully. Certain calendars in Atlanta, you will see a specific column called Imsak before Fajr. Raise your hand if you've seen it. Right? I want to see. Come on. Honestly. No? Okay. Yes, you have. Everybody has. Maybe you didn't pay attention. That Imsak time, they put it somewhere earlier um, to be safe. What did Allah says and Rasulullah said? Eat until?
Fajr. And we'll look at some other, look at what Ibn Hajar is saying. Okay, by the way, Maliki opinion is do Imsak 10 minutes, uh, stop, start fasting 10 minutes before Fajr. The reason is because uh, of one, one hadith where, uh, uh, there's a, there's a hadith that says, uh, one of the companions they saw, I think everybody's getting antsy. Guys, please, please just give me five more minutes and then you guys can move about. So, um, Rasulullah said, oh, no, one of the companions of Rasulullah he was uh, breaking his fast with Rasulullah oh, I'm sorry, uh, fa uh, astaghfirullah. See how I get distracted? I'm sorry, this, uh, it's my weakness. He was at suhoor time with Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa So he said Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi started to do imsak at, at a certain time and then there was an adhan of fajr. And then it was asked what was the time difference between the two. And he said it was reciting 50 or 60 ayat. That was the time difference between. So this is why the Malikis say give 10 minutes before fajr. However, this is an opinion of the Sahabi statement. Again, not an opinion. He saw Rasulullah do it, so it's the action of Rasulullah. But at the same time, you have Quran that is telling you eat and drink until Fajr. Eat and drink until Fajr, people. Okay? And whatever you consider Fajr according to your scholars, that's fine. But, but eat until drink. Don't, don't do it before, uh, because, uh, that is not from the Sunnah. Actually, Ibn Hajar, at his time, Ibn Hajar, at his time, maybe 600, 700 years ago, at his time he's saying one of the, this is in the Arab lands, okay? At his time, in the Arab lands, he's saying one of the most reprehensible innovations, the bid'ahs that people have is they st eating, they stop eating and drinking at the, uh, before the second adhan, and they turn the lights off so people stop eating and drinking. He's like, this is a horrible bid'ah. Okay? That in the, to indicate that it's haram to eat. Um, and whoever is doing that, is it's saying that it's erring on the side of caution, then they actually are going against the sunnah. Okay, this is Ibn Hajar. You, if you don't know Ibn Hajar, he is the Einstein of Einstein's of hadith sciences okay the guy subhanallah the scholar of allah allah he was phenomenal okay and um, anyway this is this is fajr i hope you guys kind of understand what i wanted to say we can stop here is if that's okay and then inshallah we will continue next week about uh, how do we break the fast any questions let me let me ask you yeah in, uh, in our countries mm. that uh, when they give Adhan you know, like so at different times. And then the other star, you know. so, uh, go go by your nearest masjid. Yeah, yeah that, that would be what I would recommend. Yeah, in that case. But if there's a big difference, if there's a big difference, uh, you still go to your nearest masjid because you wanna. If that's where you go, you know, that's where you go. You don't want ikhtilaf with them. Again, I said fajr is not an exact science. You can, it cannot be an exact science. It has a band, maybe 10 minute band. Then when you don't know, un, because we are live in cities, we're urban now. We, we're not, we're not suburbans where we live in the deserts and where we can clearly see the horizons and everything. You cannot, you cannot be sure when the sun is about to rise or where that's at or to be able to see that line. There is no way we can know that. No way. No way. Unless you go way out in the boonies and you can see the clear horizon and then you go, okay, now I know when Fajr begins. And go ahead, do that experiment. You'll see when you can see the slightest of the lights, it will be around 15 degrees, not 18 degrees. Okay, any other questions? No, I was going to ask a question mm. about, it, it, it said right now, not everybody can even estimate it. Don't we go by the Jama'ah, if, if the Jama'ah issued that yeah. calendar, 100%. that calendar, don't we be abide by it? 100%, yeah. 100%. So on our calendar, I only put the 15 degree Fajr time. Yeah. I should have put it on the calendar, 15 degrees, but it's a 15 degree Fajr time, and I don't have specifically IMSAC time. But what I do have is phenomenal, and hopefully, inshallah, you'll appreciate and take advantage of it. 
you know how the Hajj is placed, we supposed to pray the Hajj at the last third of the night, between the last third until Fajr, you have that time. When does the last third begin? I have the time in a column there. And I also have the time for the true midnight. Midnight not as in 12 a.m. Midnight as in the true midnight. Between sunrise and sunset, you have that time too. Why is that important? Because, because according to scholars, praying Isha after true midnight is makru. You can still pray it, but it's, it's not preferred. And you want to pray Isha before the true midnight. And you want to, if you plan to do Qiyamul Layl, you should do it after true midnight. So you'll see two extra columns on the calendar that we have. Um, I should probably show it to you. Um, it's on our Masjid al Husna. Hold on. Website. Might as well just show you. If you haven't been there, please go there. Okay, I'm going to make this large. Masjid al Husna website. I have the Ramadan calendar right here. And there's a general monthly calendar which you can use all the time. If you look at the Ramadan calendar, you will see this calendar. Okay? So you will see Qiyam time. This is true midnight.